Welcome to the second part of our video at the Welsh Organic Tannery. If you haven't watched the first part, I'll leave a card here so that you can pop back and see that first. Heating element of the, the tannery. Uh, we've got a large renewable heat initiative boiler uh, that runs on logs from our own woodland. Um, so we have a, a 10 acre woodland down the bottom. So we have a, a felling license to thin out trees as the moment we need to. And also, we get the old wind damaged tree from sure. the storm we have down here in West Wales. Yeah. Um, and so we, we, we've got a ready source of logs. So these logs get, get burned in this log gasification boiler and they heat up these two massive tanks here. Okay. Uh, and these two massive tanks are basically a large heat store. So we've got nearly 3,000 litres of water there at 90 degrees C. Okay. Um, and then from that, we can use that for all the hot water in the, the washing, uh, in, the, in the tanning process, and then it also runs the drying room as well. Okay. Um, so all the process itself is wood-fired, um, a run off a renewable heat system. And sort of sustainable woodland? Yeah, 100% sustainable. It's all run under the Glass Deer Woodland Management Scheme. Um, so yes, it's fully sustainable. So every yeah. tree we chop down, we plant 10 more. There we are. So and then you eventually copy those again and use exactly. them again. Yes. There we are. Great. So, there you go. Uh, Tanning tanks, then they look pretty specific. Yes, yeah, so they've been um, handmade um, out of wood and fiberglass, um, and they've got a paddle on there which rotates round. And that's there uh, really just to keep the skins turning to ensure that the tannin gets into all the different parts of the skin. Okay. Um, but also it keeps the tannin solution in, uh, in suspension. Okay, because what so happens after time is because it's all in suspension, but the, the solids will float sink to the bottom. Okay. And so it just keeps the whole solution in, in suspension. So the, the tannin itself is actually a bark extract. Okay. Um, so tannin comes from bark. Um, that's where you know, so you Is that all tannins across the world come from various barks? Or yes, yeah. so, so generally speaking you use bark extract, okay. um, so there's lots of different bark extracts you can use. Sure. Um, so, so, and that sits in there and then basically over the course of the week we, we tend to add more tannin to it. So okay. basically it kind of allows it to penetrate into the skin slowly over time. Okay. Um, so all we'll do is simply get the skin into the flesh and you've got a nice white back on there and simply we'll just place it flat down on the, on the surface like that yep. and then all you do you get a very technical piece of wood and you just push it under the skin uh, yeah. under, the, uh, under the liquid and it will just sit in there okay and how long will it stay in? Um, we'll, we'll check it after a week um, normally most skins take a week um, but if it's a thicker skin um, so if it's a ram skin or something like that, then it could take, you know, we've had some skins in here for, you know, a couple of months. Okay. Um, because literally the, you've got to check that the tannin's gone all the way through the skin um, to ensure that it has actually tanned properly. Um, so that's now in the... Um, so the fact some of it's floating is fine, is it? And then it yeah. will get agitated yeah, later yeah, on so and fall as it gets So basically all we, all we can do is we can just turn this on now and then... Uh, the afternoon uh, yeah. and that will just you know to keep the, uh, the skin moving around um, and then you know like I say we'll just agitate the tank you know a couple of times a day um, yeah. for the rest of the week and uh, yeah just take it out in a week and make sure it's done. And you presumably get quite a few in there at a the time or? Yeah so it, it all depends on you know I mean, it, it depends on whether it's a lamb skin, a goat skin, a large sheep skin so it's all down on volume really so there's no right or wrong answer it's all sort of by eye as okay. to yeah. I can visualise how much I can get in this tank. Sure. Um, so it might be, say, three large sheep skins, or it might be six or eight lamb skins. Okay. Um, so it all, you just kind of get a feel for what can fit in the tank. Fantastic. Okay. So there you go. Okay, so here we've got the uh, skins that have been in the tank for a week. Yep. Um, so we need to take these out now uh, and get them ready for the next part of the process. Okay. Um, so all we do again, we just grab the skin. Which is quite heavy, and just try and get as much of the tan out as possible. You can see that the, 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 the fleece changing from brown to white as I push the tannin out. So you can see there, you know, the I, fleece I, kind I, of resists the damning, but then it penetrates the skin. So exactly, yeah. So, but there are times when, you know, and, and this is the, the part of the process where sometimes, the, you know, when you push the tannin out, 
sometimes the if the, 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 the end of the hair follicle has opened up a little bit on an individual animal, yeah. and then sometimes with the hair can actually take on some of the brown golden colour. Okay. Um, because and, and it's something we can't really control because it's you know it's all it a natural part of the process and you never really know until this part how much tannin, if any, the, the fleece will take on. Okay. And uh, so the skin would always take the tanning on? Yes. Oh, so we've we never had a skin that hasn't taken on tanning yet. So you okay. can see now that before the skin was a, a white colour after we fleshed it, you'll see now that the, the skin is a, a deep deep brown colour. Um, so you've got that means all the tannin from the, uh, the tank has so penetrated all the way through the skin. So this will now go into the washing machine where we'll rinse the skin out, uh, so rinse the last of the tannin out and then spin um, the rest of the liquid out and get the skin as dry as possible. Okay. The next part of the process we need to get that onto a, a board and get it back into the drying. Okay. 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 okay, so here we've got the, the skins that we've taken out of the, the tannin tank and we're now going to put them in the washing machine um, so we can spin the, the tannin out of the fleece uh, and rinse them. Um, so that we're ready to put them on the drying boards um, to go into the drying room. They'll spin first, um, just to get as much time in that as possible, um, and then we'll, we'll give them a rinse so you can see the colour of the water. So, what happens to the um the tanning solution as it comes out of the box? So, the tanning solution as it comes out from the washing machine that goes off down to the reed bed. Okay. So we've got a reed bed that drains into our own farm pond. Okay. So we're so confident that there's no pollution from the tank. Uh, it goes through the three-stage reed bed and then the, the wastewater goes directly into our farm pond where our ducks are chicken. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, so what you've got here then, um, yeah. these are um, three concrete tanks uh, sunk into the ground. Okay. And all the wastewater from the tannery comes out the top. Yeah. Um, and the, there are reeds in there at the moment. Also, it died back at the moment because it's uh, in the middle of January. But in the summer, all the grey areas, um, they, they, uh, all the roots from the reeds will actually filter out a lot of the waste. Um, so there's three stagger tanks. Yeah. Um, and then basically clean water comes out the end. And so all the tannery waste goes into our own farm pond. And you can see our own ducks on the pond there. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, so there's very little waste um, from the tannery at all. And, and the uh, waste the waste that you are producing is clean water, essentially. Exactly, yeah. I mean, th there will be a little amount of, uh, of tannin solution in there, but because it's all plant and bark extract, sure. it's totally fine to, to put it through the reed bed. Excellent. Yeah. I think it would take a couple of minutes, um, for obviously, for the washing machine needs to fill up. Um, but yeah, so you, but at the moment, the fleece now looks quite white, it spun a lot of the tannin out, um, but obviously now we need to rinse it and just make sure we have got all the tannin out as much as possible. Because um, you see, you'll see when it goes round, there's still some brown bits in there yeah. that we need to get out. So that will now fill up the water for a couple of minutes, uh, and then we we'll rinse it, and then we'll spin it out again, ready for drying. Uh, so here we have the customer skin that's uh, come out of the tannin tank, um, and it's now been uh, let to air dry uh, on the fleece side. And we now need to peg it out onto the board so it can go into the drying room so that the leather side can dry it out. So all we do is we simply pop it on the board and we try and get it as flat as possible. And this is the problem when you have you know, sheep because they, they come from a round animal. You, know, you, you can see lots of you know, uh, undulation in the surface and round the edges. And, you know, so you've got to really try and get it as flat as possible um, when, you, uh, when you peg it out. So, the way we do that is to start off with the neck. So this will see the head end of the sheet. So we'll put some three or four tacks on the top. So that now gives us an anchor point at the top. Okay. Now, the way I always do it is you try and look down the centre line of the sheet 
So to me, from that middle tack there is about here. Yeah. And then pull that nice and tight. So it's, yeah. it's amazing how much it stretches. Surprising, isn't it? And because uh, you think, oh, that's a massive board for this uh, sort of thing. And then so you get a tack in there. And then now you've got your center line down the middle. And now we've got to pull the sides out in order sure. to get rid of these ridges. Okay. Yeah. So from here, you get one side first. And you get that nice and tight. So the tighter the better, the tighter the better, you can't overstretch it? Or? No, you can't overstretch it, so you just want to get that nice and tight. And I'll come around and do the other side. It's about keeping it symmetrical as you go, I guess. So you can see now we've lost those Big yeah. valleys in the middle of the skin. Surprising, isn't it? They, they just kind of disappeared quite yes. quickly. So, but you can see the, the corners, the legs, the back legs are still quite floppy. Yeah. Um, so what I need to do now is, you know, again, really pull it out tight. So you can see we've still got in here, we've still got some areas that need really pulled out. So again, just get that pulled right down to the edge. So you can see what started as a sheepskin that only kind of two thirds covered the board. Yeah. yeah. We we're virtually right out at the edge. So uh, Do you have bigger boards for bigger animals or? Yeah, so we do have, I mean, these are four foot boards. Yeah. Uh, we have got five eight foot boards. Okay. <laughs> just to say that. Yeah, when we did the, uh, the alpaca, for example, okay. we did have to use an eight foot board. Sure. Um, so yeah, there are certain times when you have to use a bigger board. And, uh... So now, if you feel in the middle there, you've got quite a nice tight skin. Yeah, you so, can see it. So. so we've virtually got no ridges now down the back end of this skin. Okay. So now we're going to have to do the top part. Now the top part's quite harder because you've got all the ridges around where, because obviously this is where the front leg was. Yeah. Um, so, and again, the neck is often quite wavy, so quite often you have to put quite a few more tacks in here just to okay. get the tension. So again, it's quite simple, you just pull across and get that tacked in. Again, we've got much quicker this over the years. Yeah, and you know how much you need to pull it to get it, you know, to get it tight. But... So, for example, here, between the two tacks, I will now have that kind of yeah. bit that comes up. So what I'll try and do is just get that tight as possible and then just get a tack in there so it just keeps it as flat as possible. Because when, when M comes to the buffing later on, the flatter I can get it for her, then the easier it is for her to buff. So we'll just pull this side out. It's always best to try and tuck the hair underneath if you can. Okay. There you go. And look at that one on there. You're basically just trying to make the crinkles as small as possible. Yeah. If they're going to still be there, they just... Yeah, because, you, because the skin doesn't come off the animal flat, there's always going to be a couple of you yeah. know, lumps and bumps on it. Um, but as you say, we're just trying to get it as, you know, as flat as possible so we can buff as much as possible in the next part of the process to utilise as much of the skin as possible. Oh, yeah. um, so that's now all pegged out and ready to go into the drying room. Great. So that's just the skin going in the drying room. 
and then that will sit in here for two or three days uh, while it dries. Great. And then when it's dry, we'll take it off the board and go through to the next part of the process. Brilliant. We'll see that shortly. Yeah. Is this one of our skins, Steve? Yes, yeah, so this is one of your skins that's been through the tan process, so it's now tanned and it's now been pegged out, as you can see, uh, nailed out onto a board. And this has been dried now uh, slowly for two or three days. Okay. Um, and you can see now there's no damp patches left on the skin. Uh, quite often you look for a damp patch around here where the hair's um, the, the thickest. And the, the skin is now ready to come out of the drying room and to be taken off the board. So if we take it out now and go and take it off, and then it can go through to the dry part of the process. Great. Okay. Basically all we do, we just go around and you know, just literally lift up, take all the pins out. M works around one way, I tend to work around the other way. We may hopefully meet in the middle at some point. Who's fastest? <laughs> <laughs> it all depends. So are the nails metal or are the nails... Yeah, they're just standard um, carpet tacks. Okay. Um, absolutely nothing special whatsoever. No rust issues? No rust issues, we just tap them in and then um, it just keeps the skin tight because you really want to have the skin tight like a drum yeah. so it dries in its natural form. Um, otherwise it can, you know, dry quite wrinkly, which you don't want. Well, so it can be quite tricky because they're not flat animals. When you've got a goat skin, it's the, you can tell it's a lot harder to get them flat. Okay. Is there, there's obviously a way later on that you can flatten curls out, or is it just, no. the, time, just the time thing, so you want to get the pin yes. as accurate as you yes. can? Yeah. And then also when you're doing goat skins and things like that, you've got to make sure that when you're stretching it, you stretch it in the right direction for the hair to go in, or else it's going to have a really bad bed head. Oh, okay. You know, so you've got to so, so the more hairy kind of skin, as like goats and deer, would be harder to, to get the stretching, more critical for the yeah. stretching. Yes. Because the sheep have got enough fluff to kind of cover yeah. that up later on. Yeah, and because you go through the combing machine as well, it gets rid of any. But you issues. don't get that luxury with the, the, the finer stuff. No. no. Okay. Do you charge more for the finer stuff then, or? <laughs> No, because you don't go through the cover machine. Ah, so that's work. <laughs> so, and then so the skins, that you can see the skin is now loose. Yeah. Um, so we can now turn this side over. And that's the first time you see the skin cleaned uh, and washed as it comes out of yeah. the, uh, the tanning process. It's lighter than I thought, actually. It was quite, it was quite a dark sheep in its, um, it was like it was a grey face dark more cross with a Shetland, which is really, un really unusual that it came out grey. It's, yeah. It was one of twins and they both came out the same but they're the only ones out of the same kind of mix that we've ever had. They've always come out white before, so it's, yeah. it's really unusual. It's really yeah. unusual. And you can't see the little hole on the back either, can you? Because there's no. enough wool no. to cover it. No, no. So. I think it's just like so, a little uh, comb over. So, yeah. 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 So, so you can see at this stage, but the, the back is still very, very crispy, uh, where it's you know, been dried. Yeah. Um, so we oh, need to yeah. address that, uh, which we'll do in the, in the dry part of the process. Excellent. And there are, you know, there are a couple of tangles in the middle here, um, which we will have to um, separate out. As well. okay. so, there you go. so we'll go through the dry Here's part. the buffing wheel. So we've made this ourselves. So we've got a wooden wheel with a bit of grit on and it's set to what it, the aim is, is to take the hard layer of skin off and return it to a nice soft suede and get it nice and supple again and also a lot more pleasant to feel. So it's just a case of this has to be done. Um, Extract your fans there because you do get a bit of dust in the air with anything. But we're trying to try to keep it to a minimum. Yeah. What, is there anything you can use the dust for afterwards? Um, because it is just leather and it's been organically tanned, it can be used for mulch in compost, all sorts of things. And um, we've had a lady take some to mix with resin and turn it into soles for slippers she was making. Oh, okay, so and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, and it can be compressed and you can use it to stuff toys and things because it compresses down and it's quite firm okay. at the end. But we give this away free because all of our offcuts and things we want waste pre process and we draw the it was all used. Because it is usable, so anybody who wants it Excellent. can have it. Will be noisy.
it off. So you, oh, it is really quite a lot smoother straight. You know, it's quite quick really, isn't it? And it's still yeah. crusty where you haven't touched, but. But you can see it's just only like the, the surface layer is coming off. And then it'll be, once finished, it'll be like that all over. So historically, was this just done with a knife or was this just um, not done or? I think this, it's a mixture of different techniques to do, but I think quite a lot of it was used with oils and moving it and manipulating okay. and things that didn't actually take the layer off. So but it then, just made it, flex, made it flexible but yeah. still there, whereas this is speed, speeds it up a little bit a little and bit, yeah. makes it a bit more consistent. <laughs> and sort of a lot, lot less yeah. hard work, I think. Yeah, no, it feels fantastic already though, doesn't it? So, but yeah, so I shall continue with that and then it'll be ready for the next thing. This Great. It's now been buffed. Okay. So it's all soft. Nice and and soft. Fluffy, well, well, not quite fluffy, but not nice. quite. Um, the edges are still crispy because you can never get to the edge, but because we okay. trim the end off with all the holes, uh, okay, you yeah, don't well, have you to worry about it. that. Because if you had that, it would be like standing on Lego if you had it as a rug. Yeah. wouldn't be the best. Okay. So, and then what we do after we finish doing the comb and the trimming, we hand sand just to make sure everything's perfect. Just with normal sand people then? Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure that it is all nice and done. And because of the breed of sheep this is, it won't go through our comb machine. So it okay. has to be hand combed <laughs> due to the length of it because it can then catch and just pulls. Okay. Because yeah. if it's like anything over four inches can be tricky depending on the breed. So, so yeah, it's probably so, four or five, I guess, yeah, in so, places. So what we do with this, and you can see where it's a bit clumpy in the middle. I think that might be where we folded it to roll it when we salted it, possibly. It could have been, but it could just be the weather or anything, or it may have okay. rubbed itself on a fence. So what I do is I separate it by hand because if you can feel there's like lumps in it, Okay. Yeah. So if you just give it a call. It's so quite rough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's fine. Because you won't pull it off because it's been salted properly and tanned. Yeah. The fleece won't come away. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. But it it's, just it's, breaks it. It's almost like a dreadlock in places. Almost, isn't it? yeah. yeah. But Probably isn't what you need, I guess. But. Well, no, but it happens, but at least it's not felted. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Could be worse. So, yeah, so it just gets broken by hand. Again, you're faster at it than me. Oh, it's practice and then obviously. Toughened fingers. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. My fingers are like leather, probably, but my grip's a bit rubbish as well. So. Yeah, and it's just getting used to how much you can pull and tug in which direction. Yeah, that's the other thing. I'll, I'll be honest, I've never done that. And then you can see it looks a bit more fluffy yeah. just by doing that. Sure. And then what I do when I hand comb, just use just a hairbrush. It. It's basically one of my horse's tail brushes that okay. it lost. It's <laughs> ended this way. What you do is just start at the bottom and go in the right direction of the fleece. Yeah. And it's just essentially like coven your hair. Okay. Especially with this one, but because it's got like the longer, straighter staple, yeah. it's a lot easier to do. Okay. But it, then if it was shorter, you'd, you'd use the machine yeah, in any if, case. So. Yeah, and then it would just go straight through there. But we can show you on a. We're, we keep quite a strange mix of breeds, so we've got everything from kind of Texel crosses right up to like Leicester Longmoors and Greyface Dartmoors, and this is a Greyface Dartmoor Shetland cross, so it's yeah. it's quite a weird mix. coming through, I guess. But, but it's weird because things like this are more saleable than the standard white one. Yeah. Because they're different. Because yeah. there's, the white ones are common. That's why our flock of sheep now, we've got a mixture of Shetlands, Icelandics, Jacob crosses. And we're getting some Gotlands in a few yeah. months, so we're we're aiming for the more interesting roof. Yeah, well, to be sense. honest, so that's what we did because, we, like Tina, you obviously use some of the wool, and yes. um, you kind of want a mix of colours and textures and lengths. And yeah. same with this, it obviously feeds into the the skins that we obviously like to tan. Yeah, well, obviously, like the standard white sheepskin is one of those. It's like the magnolia of the decorating world. It goes yeah. with any decor. Yeah, so it's so, fine, isn't yeah. it? It's got, it's got its place. Yeah. It's just, um, and we have white sheep as well, you know. But yeah. um, I think this is definitely more of interest to me. Although we've only managed this twice, and this was a, a Weber, and then his his twin sister was a ewe lamb, who we've actually got in the flock as a ewe, so she's due to lamb. Uh, March. Well, aren't these the ones that were supposed to come out white? Or well, all of their sort of siblings from other years have always come out white so they've you know the same length and sort of softness and texture but yeah. white the, the gray the gray thing's confusing because the mother was actually brown and the dad was white and yeah. the gray's like a double recessive that's happened once it's, it's quite an unusual scenario well, i'd love to repeat it because yeah. it's fantastic but, but it'll be interesting to see what the east sister throws mm. yeah well she went to a texel there that's the only downside because she was related to the colored rams we had yeah. so, so. with the texel the 
it'll be a very soft fleece because we find that everything that's crossed with the textile is really nice and soft. Okay, so it might might, might still be well worthwhile. Well. Hopefully, oh. a bit of grey with a softness or something. Yeah, might or it might just have like a grey edge, like a badger face type thing. Yeah, that'd be good. Time consuming at every level, it just takes it quite is. a lot of time on every skin, doesn't it? It is, and that's, but that's why we like to explain to people what we do so they can understand the process that goes in. Because we are more expensive than a chemical tannery, but it's because it's all hand done. And like if we told you we wanted this, we didn't want any of it combed out and we wanted to do it ourselves or we wanted to not do it, would you do that? Or? Yeah, basically, or we, we have a customer who doesn't like anything combed, she doesn't like it trimmed. So you just so we can say we want in. the pinholes left in it. Yeah, and, you and then that you, in. especially if you're going to use it and make it into something else. It's yeah. like goat skins that we do, or that I do for myself. I use in upholstery, so I leave them okay. as that, and then just trim them as they're required. Yeah, yeah. So it all depends what the people like the final use of the product is, because not everybody wants a rug. No, sure. Well, that's kind of part of your plan. Is Some of the ideas I've got are going to be not rug related. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's it, and the thing is, you can use them for all sorts. You can do the upholstery, you can do clothing. Well, that's everything. the sort of thoughts I'm going down with gloves and hats and various bits and bobs. Yeah, because I had a, a gentleman ring up the other day from London and they do Edwardian style outfits and they were after deer skin tanning so they could incorporate that into ah. the okay. tweeds and things. So, can you supply skins to? People that make clothing should, we, should we people could, want that? Yeah, because if we could find, because I'm connected to quite a lot of venison and deer farmers, okay. and because we've got the license from Animal Health, we can move the byproducts. Um, we so can also go to abattoirs and buy skins direct okay. as well. Do you do that much? Or? We haven't done it at all yet. Oh, we just because you don't time. need the volume because you've got yeah. so much work already. <laughs> because we're concentrating <laughs> on doing everybody else's skins, we don't really have time to do our own. Okay. We usually get like a month where we panic and get ready for Christmas. Okay. Right, okay. <laughs> well, I guess it's, you know, it's as broad as it's long if you're getting paid to do other work. It's, yeah, it's fine, and our main thing is to do customers and get other people getting the most out of their animals. That's the thing, you know, often these are the wasted. Um, oh, they are they're either incinerated or shipped off to Poland or China to be chemically tanned, and then the farmer doesn't get any benef from, benefit from that at all. Yeah. It's quite strange for us. We actually have to pay 50 pence to get our skins back from the, the abattoir. Right. Which, in my head, it seems a bit weird because they're ours, but it's obviously it's a small part of their profit margin, yeah. I suppose. So it, um, but it's, it's well worth that to I was us. I it's a small price to pay for it. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's, really, it's really <laughs> worth it for us. And obviously it costs us a lot of money to get them tanned and, and move them around and stuff. But it's, um, I just, I hate the idea of a single thing going to waste. And yeah. this, this is nuts, the idea that this may... It's shipped abroad instead of getting it actually done in Wales because it just doesn't seem to make sense. Especially when it's such a nice beautiful rug as well. This, I'm really pleased with this. I'd love another few like this. That would be great, but it probably won't happen for 20 years. You never. <laughs> okay, so you've hand, hand combed it all. Yep, so it's now looking less like it's been through a hedge. Okay, well, it probably had like. got stuck in a hedge at some point in its life, so yeah. Oh, we do have some that have quite a lot yeah. of thistle burrs and things in, so. so yeah, so the thing is now, is if we take it through to the next room, and then we can trim it into the standard rug shape. It's yeah. basically, you want it to look like a rug, but you also need to follow, you see where you've got your armpits, you've got your natural shape yeah. there and there. So what we do is you base it on how it goes. So. Standard, if you're going to use it for other things, you can follow it as close as you can. Um, so you just follow the natural shape of it as it's come off, or you can do the standard rug yeah. shape. Yeah. So how would you like yours? Um, I quite like the idea of it being as close to the shape it is as possible. Yeah. That seems to make more sense to me. No, so you just basically come in, work out where you've buffed up to. So you're removing the crispy edges. Yeah. But this is why no rug, no two rugs will ever look the same. Because they're all hand cut. They're, they're all hand cut. It's all done by eye, and it all depends as well how they come off the animal. Because each slaughterman is different how the skin. Can you kind of pick slaughterman out once you've? You do, and it's like we have a, a customer from the south and they've obviously changed like either staff because it's not as neat as it was, so I think they must have somebody new learning the job. Okay. But you can see as time progresses how it gets easier. 
So you can you could pick out an experienced slaughterman yeah. o- over someone that was doing it as a, a first day apprentice type role. Yeah, and also some people who do their own home kills and skin, and you can tell the difference as well right. when you're only doing like a couple once in a blue moon. It's like any of these kind of fairly traditional skills that you know they're a lot harder than they look. Yeah, and the thing it's the case of as you say, you just get used to it and you get the feel of it. And quite a lot of it is either done by eye or by feel. And even sometimes sound, because our buffing wheel, you can tell the sound of how you're getting through the leather. It still sounds quite crinkly when you cut it, but I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever cut any of it before. so it's um... Yeah, it's, it's quite thick. I don't know whether it's because of the breed that you've got, because it's not an old no. skin. Because sometimes when you get an older one, they're so thick, it's ridiculous. I had a seven-year-old deer skin that I struggled to cut and it took a lot of effort to get through the neck. All right. It's very technical, though, Stanley Knife. Oh, yes. There are many jobs that a Stanley Knife can do, though. Oh, yeah. And the best day is when it, it's new blade day. <laughs> <laughs> That's a case of... Next mm-hmm. trick is to... What we do is we go around the edge because you can see where it's gone up to the edge for the buffing. So we have a final tidy up with it's just literally just sandpaper and just, yeah, just, just refine the edges of it. Yeah, because where you can't get in sometimes where you've got the crinkles around the neck, the buffing wheel won't get in fully. Yeah. So you just go around and just give a thing just to make sure that it's all neat and tidy. Yeah. How do you get all the dusty bits off at the end? You re-brush them. Oh, okay. So yeah, you basically brush the underneath. Yep. And make it thing, and then... So that was it, practically Ready finished. On. Just about, yeah. So it just needs a little bit of pan finishing around the edges with the comb and finishing off underneath. And then other people, we brand it with our hot iron brand and to mark it natural or organic. Yeah. But you, like yours, unbranded because you're using it to make... Well, that's the plan. We're going things. to use it to make yeah. other things eventually. We haven't quite got there yet. But yeah, the at last the moment, thing you want is a Welsh organic tannery thing right in the middle. Yeah, no, but, <laughs> but it's, it's good that you could do that to prove its kind of origin yeah, for other and where people. it's come from. Yeah. yeah. But now that it's been done and it's finished, it's fully machine washable. So you can wash it in your own washing machine at home because obviously it's been through our washing machine several times. Yeah. So, yeah. And Excellent. Well, thank you very much. It looks no absolutely problem. fantastic. Brilliant. Thank you for your time. That's all right. Thank you. A big thank you to Emma and Steve at the Welsh Organic Tannery for showing us around. It was really great to see what you're up to. Thanks again, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.